others over self. Others over self. You know, Jesus talks, and, and, and we're going to study his command, that, that uh, there's really two things in life that we should be doing. Really two, two summary statements of what it means to live for the Lord, or to be a Christian uh, in our practical life. In Matthew 22, uh, verse 37, if you want to turn there, I want to read these, and I want to just kind of see what you're thinking about it before we get started. Matthew 22, verse 37, the Bible says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. You say, what's the most important commandment, the great commandment? Love God with all your heart. But there's a second one, Jesus says. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's Matthew 22, verse number 39. Love God and love others as ourselves. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Who is my neighbor? This is the, the second greatest commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. Who is that person? Who, 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 who is that talking about? And how should I treat them? Go ahead and turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 10. So where we're going to start today, Luke chapter 10. But I really do think that, um, you know, I began to study this because of our life group. And I say we're all to have this same mind mm -hmm. to consider others, their things above our own things. Mm -hmm. Others over self. And I see this as a theme in what Jesus is living, what Jesus is teaching. And uh, this, is, this is so important. Um, Jesus, uh, a couple times, he, he uses the phrase uh, in one passage, go and do likewise, talking about serving another. And John 13, he, he gives this quote. He says, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So I, I want to highlight this particular section of Scripture as an example, and I want us to think about it. I want us to examine it. I want us to talk about it. Because if this is the second greatest purpose, commandment that we have as, as Christians. This second, Jesus said this is the second most important thing. Well, we need to figure out how to do this thing. And uh, that's really important. So let's look in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 25. Shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? That's our first question tonight. Who is my neighbor? is my neighbor. I'm going to read this story, and then we're going to walk through it together. And Jesus answered him. He says, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by the other side. You know, I read it slow, and it's almost like, oh, what's the priest going to do? He's got to do something. And he didn't do anything, okay? The priest, he's on the other side of the street, walking on by. And likewise, a Levite. Sounds like an important guy. Maybe he should do something. When he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion 
on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. We talk a lot about following Jesus, even in our mission statement. We are a family going above and beyond to help people find and follow Jesus. We want people to find Jesus. But when we follow him, that's where it gets really practical. That's, that's the nuts and bolts of it. When we find out who is Jesus, how did he live? And over and over in his life and in his teaching, he is telling us that we ought to take our eyes off of ourselves and look on others. Not only to look on others, because in this passage, as he describes being a neighbor, uh, there were two people that looked on someone else. They, one looked from a distance, and he, he passed by on the other side of the street. The Levite, it, when he passed by, he looked on him, and he kind of checked out. He realized there was a problem. Well, he kept going. But then there was a Samaritan, and he did something about it. And he, he was a neighbor to him. He loved his neighbor as himself. So I want to look through some of the scriptures where Jesus is teaching us this, uh, this truth, this idea of showing compassion on others or, or loving our neighbor as ourself. And I want to answer the question with some specific verses, who is my neighbor? Because if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to be able to recognize who it is we're supposed to be caring for, all right? I want you to be crystal clear that when you run into a circumstance, you can say, Yes, this is the person I'm supposed to care about. And then I want us to also be able to say, okay, what am I supposed to do now? How do I treat them? What, what is it that's expected of me? If I'm following Jesus' example, not so much even what's expected, how can I be like Jesus to them? How can I be an ambassador, a representative of Christ? So who is my neighbor? We're going to come back to this Luke chapter 10 passage. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Uh, this is a somewhat of a topical study, but we'll be back in this text specifically when we look at how we should treat our neighbor. We'll use this as a, as a good example passage. But I want you to see, who is my neighbor? How do we identify who we're supposed to love as ourselves? 1 John three sixteen, The Bible says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. That's how we know God loves us. How, how can you know God loves you? Well, he paid the ultimate price for us. He died on a cross for me, and he died on a cross for you. He loves us. And because of that, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwell, dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. This gets really down to the nitty-gritty of practical Christian living. This is 1 John three sixteen through 18. He said, Whoso, whoever has this world's good, if you, if you have some money, if you have some resources, if you've got some stuff, uh, maybe you're like Merle and you've got a lawnmower, uh, maybe you're like Tammy and you've got some food to cook, you have this world's good, you've got some stuff to offer. The Bible says if, if you have some stuff to offer and you see your brother that has need, you see someone else with a need, and it says, if you shut up your bowels of compassion, the idea is like, hey, sometimes we have resources and we come across somebody in our life and they have a need. 
and we see the need, but the Bible says we, we refuse to care. We refuse to have compassion. The Bible says, how dwells the love of God in him? Meaning, the love of God that you receive, you're definitely not showing it if you're shutting off your bowels of compassion, okay? That's, uh, that's the way that the Scripture puts it. We're not to love just in word. We're not to say, I love the world the way God loves the world. No, we're to show it in deed and in truth. We, we actually do something. So who's my neighbor? Number one, here's your first blank. Someone with a need. Someone with a need. If you see someone with a need, uh, I believe it in Scripture, God... God is allowing you and giving you permission, dare I say, an opportunity to meet that need. And many times, God will line up us with our resources. You may not have all the resources, because sometimes you come across people and they have a need and you can't meet it. Someone else can, right? You can't meet every need, but there are needs that you have this world's good and you see the need and you have the ability to open up in compassion for them. Your neighbor is someone with a need. Uh, back in our passage where we were at in Luke chapter 10, uh, this, this person um, who fell among thieves, he had a clear need. He was hurting, right? He had a need, and there were two people that saw him. They could have helped, but they didn't help. They were not a neighbor to that person. They were not loving him as their self. Who is my neighbor? Number one is someone with a need. Number two. Uh, if, if you uh, look back in Philippians chapter 2, I want to recap what we learned last week. In Philippians, we are looking at this passage where he's talking to a church. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to um, brothers and sisters in Christ. And he says to them in Philippians 2 verse 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. He's specifically looking at you church people, right? Uh, to look at each other and say, these are my neighbors. These are the ones I'm here to serve, each other. We serve each other. We, we're here to help each other. Uh, look not every man at his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In Philippians, um, there, he's actually talking about one of his workers, Timothy, and he's saying, he said, he, he uses the statement, all seek their own, but not the things which are Christ's. And the idea is saying, hey, I, I'm trying to find somebody who will care for you, but it's hard to find somebody who's going to care for you because a lot of people are self-centered. And, and he's teaching against that self-centeredness like we went over. Others over self. It's others first. So who is my neighbor? I, I believe Scripture shows clearly in 1 John 3. Uh, it's someone with a need. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible is really clear that your, your neighbor is your brothers and sisters in Christ. So when you see someone in this church with a need, and they're your brother and sister in Christ, this is an opportunity for you to love them as you love yourself. In John chapter 13, Jesus talks specifically about Christian disciples caring for other disciples. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, John 13, 34, that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. This whole idea of loving God with all our, all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving others as ourselves, that's like, well, that stuff should define us. That should be like, how do I know what Christians are like? Well, do they love God or do they love each other? Do they love God or do they love others? That's the whole, that's the whole thing. That's where, that's, it's all summed up in that. All men will know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. So what does it say when we, when we have Christian brothers and sisters that have needs, legitimate needs, and you have resources to meet those needs, and we just decide not to, right? We have to consider one another's needs. We have to think about one another's needs. We have to love our neighbor as ourself. So who is my neighbor? I think it's somebody with a need, according to Scripture. The Bible talks it as our brother and sisters in Christ. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. So much about how we should deal with other people. This is, this is the tough one. This is, 
You say, who's my neighbor? All right. Somebody in need. A lot of you love helping people in need. We have our, our food pantry here. And uh, one of the easiest things to do is to come to the pantry and serve because you see people and they're so thankful because they have a need. And they, they're saying, thank you for helping me feed my kids. Thank you for helping with the food. And you know what? That's a great thing to be able to do. And we do that. And, uh, you know, uh, that's what we do. We, we, we are all sharing and meeting those needs. And that's what we do. That's the easy part, I think, brothers and sisters. In Matthew chapter 5, listen to this. Jesus says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, heard that, right? And hate, and hate thine enemy. Matthew 5, 43. Verse 43, sorry. Matthew 5, verse 43. You've heard it's been said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. No, it sounds kind of right, right? Nope. No, it's not according to Jesus. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This whole thing is about living the example that Jesus lived. It's not so much just about loving those in need that are like us, that get along with us. It, Jesus gives the example and the teaching that we are to love those that don't like us, that are not like us, that actually curse us and hate us, that use us, those that curse me, those that hate me, those that use me, those that persecute me. And he says, you know what, the, the unsaved, the publicans, the sinners, he said, they take care of their own. It makes sense for Christians to take care of Christians. But what about those who aren't like us, who don't think like us? What about, I don't know your p political affiliation, but let's just say, what if your neighbor puts a sign in their yard that is not in agreement with your political beliefs. Should you show love to your neighbor? Yes. Well, of course, according to Scripture. But that's where, you could say, where the rubber meets the road. That's where uh, what Jesus is teaching really questions whether or not we're going to follow. Okay, is Are we treating people like enemies because they're enemies? Or are we treating people like Jesus treats us? Uh, has anyone in here ever been the enemy of God before? Before we were saved, we're all the enemies of God. We do things that God hates. We lie, we steal, we lust, we're selfish, we go our own way, we deny Him. But for some reason, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He, he at His own expense... As we learned last week, even though he was God, he, he became a servant. He, he became in the form of a human to serve the humans, okay? That's the craziest thing, that God would leave heaven to serve us. Those, not even the humans that liked him, but the ones that didn't like him. And he would die. He would, he would go at great uh, sacrifice of, of his own self, of his own detriment for those that were against him. That's the example that Jesus gives us when we are following the command to love our neighbor as ourself. It's not just when we see someone, someone with a need or a brother and sister in Christ. It's also those that are not like us. The ones that don't believe like us, that don't look like us, um, the ones that go to places that we wouldn't go to. Those are our neighbors, okay? So who is your neighbor? Help me answer that question. Everybody. That's right. Everybody. 
Everyone can be your neighbor. Uh, if you're looking at your points here, uh, someone with a need, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my enemies, and everyone can be your neighbor. Those are your blanks. Who is my neighbor? Um, when Jesus came and died, who did he die for? The sins of the whole world. Whosoever will, anybody, everybody, he still loves the people that curse him and hate him just as much as he loves you and me. Okay? We, he don't love us anymore because we're we, we are loved based upon what Jesus did for us. You understand? He, he is so good to us, and, and He shows grace to us, and we should do the same for others that aren't like us. Someone with a need, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my enemies, anyone, everyone can be my neighbor. Everyone, if you're following Christ, should be able to receive the love of God through you. We just have to be aware of that. That's like putting on a new set of glasses, you know. Um, I, I remember I used to wear glasses, and um, I had bad eyesight. I had really bad eyesight. And I, I just, if I didn't wear my glasses, I couldn't see the leaves on the trees or anything like that. And I remember um, getting, I remember the day in like eighth grade when I got glasses. And I put them on, and I was like, what are these things all over the trees? They're the leaves. You could see like individual leaves. And uh, it is an amazing thing when you first get glasses. But that's, that's the idea. It's when you come to Christ as a believer, he, he can change you from the inside out. And we allow him. The Bible says we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. And our mind initially says, hate my enemy. Listen, they're going to be losers and not believe what I believe. And they're going to make life difficult for me. And, and they're going to try to put all this stuff on my Facebook page. And they're going to put this in my community. And were, Wait a second. That's a natural response to, to love those like you and, and hate those that are your enemies. But God can transform us to put, like, put it on glasses is where we see everyone as our neighbor. Someone, it's like the second most important purpose that you're here for. It's not just to love God, it's to love everybody as yourself, love your neighbor as yourself. So we know who our neighbor is. It's, it's really anybody. Uh, you can really recognize someone that God may want you to serve because it's a brother and sister in Christ. That's definitely clearly taught. Maybe you see somebody with a specific need and you have resources and you can meet that need. Well, maybe God's leading you to meet that need. Or maybe you see somebody and they are directly your enemy. One of the best things you can do is to say, that is an opportunity. It's not somebody that I should avoid and never go by and, and make sure that make, I can make their life harder. How can I help them? You know, maybe take their trash can in, right? Uh, that's a really good thing to do. But how should I treat my neighbor? What does it look like to be a good neighbor? How should I treat I want you to turn back. And I want you to look in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, you've got the priest. Man, you just think the priest might have done something, don't you? Whether you call that a pastor walking by or you priest or whatever. I like to think of it as a priest because I like to think I would do something. But, you know, uh, it wasn't a pastor in this illustration. But you know what? You had one of God's people in this situation and you had a Levite and they really dropped the ball, right? They're supposed to be representatives of God. And then you've got somebody who's a Samaritan. And in this situation, I'm not going to go into all the details, but it's, uh, it, it's most likely somebody uh, of a culture that are enemies. It's, it could be like the Israelis and the Palestinians, something to that effect. The idea of two groups of people, they don't like each other. They, they shouldn't like each other. They shouldn't get along. But this Samaritan, verse 33, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had, what's the word? Compassion. compassion on him. He had compassion on him. The first point here is show compassion. Show compassion. Look, look at the example of what he did. The Bible says he had compassion on him. What does compassion look like? The Bible says he went to him, that's an interesting one. Um, just an observation that God's bringing to my mind. 
oftentimes we say, they should get help. They, they need to figure it out themselves. If they would simply go get the resources they need, maybe their problem wouldn't be so bad. You know, we kind of we say that about people. We get judgmental. They're only in that situation because, you know, X, Y, Z. You give the reason. When this example that Jesus gives, the Samaritan went to him. He didn't say, no, well, if he comes and asks me for help, I'll help him. And I let him, let him get over, you know, come and ask for help. You know, he went to him. The Bible says he bound up his wounds. If you want to make an additional note under this, show compassion. Uh, when I see somebody binding up his wounds, help them with what hurts. Help them with what hurts. Um, many of us has, have spiritual gifts that God's given us to really do this, to empathize, to have the gift of mercy, to understand and feel what others are feeling. But usually, if God is prompting you and God is showing you and you're being uh, led by the Spirit, you'll be able to see the need. In this particular situation, this guy was injured. You know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. Sometimes we go to people and they have a particular injury. I don't know what the injury might be. Maybe it's a relational problem at home. Maybe it's trouble with their kids. Uh, maybe it's a financial problem. And... Um, we just want to talk to them only about spiritual matters. We want you, yeah, the most important need is for them to get saved, but sometimes you, you begin to show compassion by meeting the need of what hurts, helping them with their immediate needs, binding up wounds. It says he poured in oil and wine, some ointment there, and set him on his own beast. Don't only help them with what hurts, give of your own self. This is, uh, I mentioned that, that book, Boundaries, I think, last week. Uh, sometimes we can set boundaries that are unbiblical. We can say, I need to insulate myself from anybody with problems and craziness and troubles because I don't want that to affect me. I'm having a good sunshiny day, and I don't want them to rain on my parade, right? I don't want that in my life. Let that stay away from me. In this situation here, I'm, I'm assuming this Samaritan had somewhere to go, walking down this road with thieves on it. I just assume he's got a place to be. He's got a schedule. He's got somewhere he's going. But he saw this person. He went to him, bound up his wounds. But the Bible says he set him on his own beast. Sometimes it, well, not sometimes, when you love your neighbor as yourself, it costs you something. There's an expense to it. Sometimes it's an actual financial expense. You're going to have to pay for a meal to cook for somebody. Uh, maybe, maybe you're going to have to uh, watch your neighbor's kids. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're going to have to pay, help somebody with a bill. Maybe, I don't know what your expense is. Maybe this guy put him, uh, set him on his own beast. Maybe for you that means you're going to have to give somebody a ride. You're going to have to pick them up, give them a ride, whatever it is. I don't know. But this is the example Jesus is giving us. Uh, he, he's telling us to go and do likewise, right? He bound up his wounds, poured in oil and wine, set him on his own beast. And then it goes on to say, and he could have probably could have stopped there, but he, he kept going. He brought him to an inn, took care of him. And then on the next day, so he like st just changed a whole day's worth of a schedule for this guy. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. He didn't, he's, he's, he's got an expense, but he says, you know what, if there's anything else, I got it covered. I am going to see this guy through to the end. Uh, here's, here's my last point under show compassion is go above and beyond to show that you care. That, that's when he brings him to an end gives money to the host, he says, whatever else comes, I got it. There's something to be said uh, about doing more than bare minimum, don't you think? Because when somebody, if you've ever received help or you've ever been helped by somebody, you know they're just trying to make a good gesture. They're not really helping you. You know what it feels like when somebody goes the distance, when somebody goes above and beyond. And there's something about this example here that to me is a good picture of above and beyond. It's something where you, you don't just do bare minimum. Hey, 
so, let's call the, somebody over. Hey, can you help him? All right, cool. I made a phone call. I'm good. No, maybe it's to follow up the next day like this guy and to make sure things are going okay. Maybe to be a good neighbor, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot more time than you even think. It's not just a one-time thing. Maybe it's going to be a weekly thing. You help somebody week after week after week. Show compassion. Uh, that word compassion is so frequent in the Scripture. Compassion is the love of God in action. Okay, it's, it's, that, it's, it's not only... Compassion isn't necessarily just a feeling. I feel such compassion for them. It's like, oh, I hurt. Me. Look, at they're, so, they're, they're doing so poorly. No, it's like, I'm going to do something about what I feel. Uh, it's, it's action. Number one, how should I treat them? Show compassion. Number two, uh, reflect on our passage from last week and show you the passage I mentioned. If you turn in John chapter 13, John chapter 13, verse number four, John 13 and verse number four. And it is the same illustration in Luke chapter 10. What is this person doing? What is this Samaritan doing for this injured man? Saving him. Saving him. He's serving him. It's a lot to go out of your way to wrap up somebody's wounds, to clean them up. I probably had a hard time getting on the, the donkey or whatever he was riding on, on the beast. Uh, you've got you've to work at it, put in some sweat. In John 13, we see this example, this, this same message Jesus is telling, just in another way. John 13, 4, he riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. This is Jesus. And after that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Peter, he just changed his mind all over the place. He says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He's just, you know, don't do it. And then he's like, all right, wash me everywhere. Just clean me up. <laughs> then Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not to save his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments he and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? He's about to teach him a lesson, an object lesson. Um, he, 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 he's actually cleaned their feet. There was a little bit of a hidden sermon in there about somebody about to betray him. But he goes on to say, Ye call me Master and Lord. And ye say, Well, for so I am. Is Jesus the Master? Yes, yes he is. Is Jesus the Lord? Yes. You bet he is. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you had also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. We talked last week about others over self, others over self, becoming a servant. Jesus, the Bible says he became obedient. He took on himself the form of a servant. And this is really that illustration. And what he's saying is, is listen, I am God. In Philippians, we read that. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He knew he was God, but he decided to serve. He disregarded his reputation, serving to the point of washing someone's feet. Basically saying, I am not too good to do this task, and neither should you be. You say, I'm the master and I'm the Lord, you're correct. 
He says, the servant is not greater than his Lord. And us, his disciples who are sent, are not greater than the one that sent him. And so the example is, when it comes to serving our neighbor, loving our neighbor, caring for each other, there should not be a task that we're saying, that's not for me. Now, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, I think of things like Bruce is an electrician. Um, there are certain things I say, that's not for me, because I'm going to shock myself and die, okay? I'm not going to come to your house and help you with electricity. Thank you. Uh, that, that's not what I mean by that. But what that means is you're not too special, too holy, too good to serve. And no, no one of us is. And that's the example that Jesus sets, that we can leave whatever pedestal we think we're on in our own selfishness and we can serve because, we're, uh, because our Lord served. How should we treat our neighbor? Number one, show compassion. Number two, become a servant. Oh, look at that. I have a blank there. It's not actually a blank. Become a servant. <laughs> Just write your name in there. Become a servant. <laughs> Pastor Matt, become a servant. Write your name in there, huh? How about that? That's what it was meant to be. No, I made a mistake there. Uh, become a servant. We love you. Oh, boy. Here's another teaching of Jesus. We've read this one already. Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Here's how you should treat somebody that you're serving. You should bless them and pray for them. Bless them and pray for them. Speak well of them. Could you imagine speaking well? Maybe in front of, maybe to their face, you're that neighbor you really don't like, it's a thing. Uh, you got to ask yourself, are you going to follow Jesus or not? You know, <laughs> Are you going gonna to love your neighbor or not? Bless them and pray for them. Speak to God on their behalf. When was it the last time that that person that maybe has been hurting you or, or uh, mean to you or unkind to you or seemingly trying to make your life difficult, when was the last time you prayed to God on their behalf? How do we treat them? We show compassion. We become a servant. Bless them. Pray for them. Uh, here, here's the final one. And really, I think this wraps it, wraps it all up. Because sometimes we get to a point with people where we say, yeah, I like Tammy. She's my neighbor. I would love to serve Tammy. I'd love to help her. She's nice. She's nice to me. Ah, Mike. I like serving others. And I see Mike, and I would love to serve Mike. But then it comes to that one person. You say, everyone should be my neighbor. Yeah, except for, and you know who it is in your life. Who? Maybe it's Pastor Matt. No. <laughs> Listen, there is somebody in your life that sometimes we just kind of give them a stiff arm with God's love. They, they're not deserving of God's love. That's called bitterness and unforgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4 is my final passage. I told you I was hopping around here a little bit. But I don't think we can teach on how to treat our neighbor unless, unless I teach on this thing to do, and that's to forgive them. Forgive them. Let all bitterness, Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice. We're following Jesus, right? He's transforming us. And that means he's getting all the bitterness out. He's getting all the wrath and anger out. There is no room, like we talked about last week, there's no room for strife or vainglory. There's no room in, in the body of Christ. There's no room in somebody who says, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. There's no room for these things. They're supposed to be put away from you, taken out of your life, and replaced with this. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted. 4.31 and 32. Ephesians 4.31 and 32. No, you're fine. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, 
even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Jesus is teaching in Matthew 6, verse 14, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive men not their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The whole purpose, uh, the, whole, the, whole, the only way that we can actually love our neighbors is if we receive God's love, right? We, we can love others. We can extend grace because God extends grace. This is so difficult when somebody has actually wronged you, has actually cursed you or whatever, because we can say, I'm loving God and I am loving my neighbor. But if we know deep down inside that there's one person or two people and you say, I will love everyone else, but forget them, cut them off, don't deal with them. They don't deserve God's love. That doesn't work, okay? I'm just saying that that, that does not line up with this passage. Uh, God's followers, those that are following his example, that's us, those that are supposed to be good neighbors to all those neighbors. It requires of us that we'll be willing to do the hard work of forgiveness. And that is difficult. But if God tells us to do that, then we can expect that he's going to help us do that. Um, I don't know what that means for you. Uh, I've, I've had various cir- circumstances and situations. I'm not going to get into them with my family and things like that. But I know family many times is at the root of some of those things. Family hurts, family strife, family troubles. But I believe that God can help us As he says, love our enemies. Bless them that curse us. Do good to them that hate us. Pray for them which use us and persecute us. He'll allow us to forgive.